The more value that a person places upon an object or a thing is often determined by how much that person desires the object or the thing to be a part of their lives. Let me suggest to you that what a person considers as being valuable is very often a personal idea, a personal thought. What's valuable to you, maybe not to me. What I look at as valuable, you. One man's meat is another man's poison, right? I've heard that. Let me give you another example. <coughs> Ferrari Motor Company makes a vehicle that has a 950 horsepower motor. It'll go from zero to 60 in less than 360, or in less than three seconds. It's got a top speed of 217 mile an hour. Would you like one, Landon? Yeah, yeah, Landon would like one. When I was your age, Landon, I want one of them. Price tag is $1,400,000. Now, to some people, this vehicle may be valuable. But, but I'll be honest with you. To me, a vehicle is a means to get from point A to point B. That's the purpose of a vehicle. Therefore, to me, the Toyota out in the parking lot that Margaret and I drive is just as valuable as that very expensive Ferrari sports car would be to many other people. More valuable, especially since the Ferrari's only got two seats in it. And they're both in the front. It'd be hard to get the grandkids in there, or the golf clubs in there, or if we're going to go visit another congregation, one of our brothers or sisters from the church in there with us. Well, if we speak of value as being a personal opinion, we're going to consider the value of the church to many people. <coughs> In the year 2006, according to the Yearbook of American Canadian Churches, there were 217 different denominations of Christian churches that were found in the USA and in Canada. According to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity, the number of denominations throughout the entire world is somewhere near 41,000. Nobody knows for sure. And the reason the number of Christian denominations throughout the world is so high is that individual villages and tribes of people in third world countries often have their very own denomination, which is different from the one right down the road two or three miles away. Let me suggest to you here today that to a lot of folks in the world today, the church or churches of the world would be, don't take this wrong, but it's true, would be a dime a dozen. If you don't like that one, try that one. And if that one don't suit you, there's a whole bunch more that you can choose from. Isn't that the way a lot of people look at the church today? But I want us to consider today the value of the church. The church. In order to consider the value of the church, I want us to consider something else too. I want us to look at how God considers His people. Under the Old Testament times, when the law of Moses was the commands under which one was to live. And the nation of Israel was considered as God's chosen people. Even back then, God promised, I'm going to make a new covenant. 
and I'm going to make a new covenant with my people. He then was promising the New Testament, which was to come, which was only in the mind of God at that time. But I want us to consider what God says through Jeremiah the prophet in the long ago. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 and 32, God says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Did you get that? How did God describe Himself in His relationship to Israel and Judah? What was the phrase that God used? God says, I was a husband unto them. Does this give you some idea as to how precious in the eyes of God, God's people are to Him? Earlier in the book of Jeremiah, God had spoken to Jeremiah the prophet and compared Israel and Judah to an unfaithful wife. Indeed, these nations of people had been unfaithful to God. Notice, if you will, in Jeremiah 3, verses 6 through 8, these words of God to Jeremiah, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She hath gone up on every high mountain and, on, and, and under every green tree. Now what that means is, in the Old Testament, the nations which worshipped idols had particular places where they would worship. For one thing, they believed that the closer, the higher up you were, the closer you were to God. And so they would go up on top of a mountain and there they would build their altars. And there they would worship to their gods. Or else they believed that if they were down where the greenery was, in the groves, that it was a place where they were closer to God. And so they would go and worship there. And so in the Old Testament, we read a lot about the high places and the groves as being places where idol worshipers worship. And God says through Jeremiah that Israel, his own people, his bride, because he was their husband, he says, she's going backsliding. She is worshiping in the high places. She is worshiping in the groves. And then he goes on and says, and she has played the harlot. She's unfaithful to me. And I said after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. Come back. I'll take you back. Come back. But she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. So God, the husband, had divorced Israel, his wife, and she had been carried into the captivity of the nation of Assyria around the 700s B.C. Now, she's not going to remain forever in that horrible situation of captivity. In fact, in the book of Hosea, chapter 2 and verse 7, God compares Hosea's unfaithful wife. Her name was Gomer. Gomer. Not Gomer Pyle, but Gomer, the wife of Hosea the prophet. Hosea had an unfaithful wife, and God compares Hosea's unfaithful wife to the nation of Israel and draws a conclusion that Israel too will come to. We read in Hosea 2 and verse 7, Then shall she follow, Gomer, Hosea's wife, then shall she follow after her lovers, and Israel too, by the way, but she shall not overtake them, she shall seek them, but shall not find them, then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, 
for then was it better with me than now. Israel's going to be set free from the bondage that they were experiencing under the nation of Israel, and they're going to find out that it's better to be in that condition than it is in the bondage of Assyria. They're going to be able to go back to God. Why? Because God loves Israel as a faithful husband loves his wife. We found then, under the Old Testament times, Israel, God's people, they were considered by God to be His bride, His wife. That's how God felt toward that nation. A closeness shared by those united in marriage in the New Testament. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, the great apostle Paul teaches a lesson concerning husbands and wives and how they are to treat one another. But in reality, we're going to find that the inspired writer Paul isn't just teaching about marital harmony here in this passage, but rather he's got a much deeper spiritual meaning in mind. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, beginning of verse 22 and going through verse 25, it says, Wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You ever considered? That's the perfect recipe for marital harmony. It'll work. It'll bring about marital happiness. Wives, be in submission to your husbands just as you would to the Lord. And husbands, love your wives just as much as Jesus loved the church. You know what would happen to the divorce rate if people did this? It'd be gone. It wouldn't exist anymore. But you know what? It almost sounds like Paul was really trying to tell us not just how to get along as husbands and wives, he is, but he goes on and he says, there's something else I want to tell you about this situation of marriage. And he does so in Ephesians 5.32 when he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Just as Israel was the bride of Almighty God in the Old Testament times, so the church is the bride of Jesus Christ today in the New Testament times. And since the church today is the bride of Christ, then we begin to get some idea as to the value of the church to the Lord. The church is extremely valuable. So valuable, in fact, that Jesus was willingly killed, gave His life and shed His blood so the church could have its existence. To the elders from the city of Ephesus, the Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Take heed therefore unto, your, therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which He hath purchased with His own blood. You know, this is the church that God promised in the long ago when God spoke to Abraham. Well, well, before he was known as Abraham, he was called Abram. But Abram was still living in Ur of Chaldees, down in Babylon, down in Iraq today. We read God saying to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, He says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And certainly God held up His end of the deal. The name of Abraham is even yet today known throughout the world. The Jews under the Old Testament were God's bride. He protected them, He fed them, He led them, He blessed them abundantly. Their allies were blessed. Their enemies were destroyed. But I want you to note the last words of this verse. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's a promise of the church to come. An institution which would be made up not of just Jews, but of Jews and Gentiles alike. 
It's through the prophet Daniel that we learn of the time when this wonderful institution known as the church would have its beginning. If you'll remember, it was in the year 606 B.C. that the Babylonians, under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar, had taken the Jews of Judea and Jerusalem into captivity. It was because God's people, His bride, had turned against Him, and as God said, had gone a-whoring, worshiping other gods. She had turned against her husband. And so God was punishing His bride by letting her be carried into captivity by the Babylonians. Now, one of those who had been taken into captivity from Judah to Babylon was the prophet Daniel. It happens that King Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed a dream. A dream of a giant statue with a head of gold and chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet made up of iron and clay. And then in his dream he saw a stone which had been made without human hands. Been made by the hand of God. Not by human hands, but by the hand of God. And that stone smote the image on the feet and of the image. And the image was totally broken up and destroyed. And then that stone grew into a mountain that filled the whole earth. And Daniel interprets this dream for the king and tells him the image represents the worldwide empires that were at that time and would be in the future. They included the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Macedonian Empire headed by Alexander the Great, and the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire ended up being ruled by kings, not just by one, but by several, including Herod, who was the king in Palestine during the days when Jesus our Lord walked upon the earth. But I want you to notice what Daniel through inspiration says in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. He says, in the days of these kings, what kings? Those kings of the Roman Empire. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Daniel, through inspiration, is able to tell the king of Babylon that the time would come when the God of heaven would establish a kingdom that would never end. It happened in the days of the Roman kings, in the days when Jesus walked upon the earth. And he was talking about the church. That's the kingdom. You ever, you ever notice that there are some, excuse me, who think that the church was an afterthought of God? Oh, man. You know what the scientific name for that stuff that comes out of you is? Uh, yucky, yeah. Or as, as Darvine says, snot. <laughs> uh. <coughs> there are some people who believe that the church was an afterthought of God. That Jesus was sent to this earth in order to set up a physical kingdom. That he was to be in Jerusalem, sitting upon the throne of David. And from there he was to rule his people, the Jews. That's what Jesus had come to the earth to do. But because he was killed upon the cross, this was not possible. And so the church was established to take the place of this physical kingdom till such time as the Lord will come back to Jerusalem and there He will sit on a throne in Jerusalem and rule His people. Just think one thing wrong with this line of thinking. It's not in the Bible. Absolutely false. In Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus made the statement to Peter. He says, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, and death will not destroy it. Even the death of Jesus will not destroy it. It will bring it into existence. Jesus didn't come to the earth to rule a physical kingdom, but to die, shed His precious blood, and give Himself for the most valuable thing in His mind, the church the spiritual bride and body of the Lord. An institution made up of all Jew and Gentile alike. An institution headed by the very Son of God, Colossians 2 
or one in verse 18 says he's the head of the body the church since the church is the body of Christ how valuable is it yeah there are many other points that one may make concerning the value of the church but we've seen the church is valuable because it's the it's the bride of Christ it's the body of Christ it is that for which our Lord shed His blood and gave His life. It's eternal. Even death itself cannot destroy this blood-bought institution, the church. It is the kingdom that was set up by Almighty God and according to Daniel the prophet and the Lord Himself will stand forever. You can be a member of it of the most valuable institution there is. The church. But you can't join it. And you can't get voted in. You can't even buy your way into the church. But today, you can become a member of it. In the book of Acts chapter 2, the Apostle Peter is preaching that first gospel sermon concludes his sermon in verse 38 by saying, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. And the same day there was added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then we get down to verse 47 of Acts chapter 2, and we read that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, you can't join it. You can't be voted in. You can't buy your way in. But the Lord will add you when you through obedience to His Word rise up out of the watery grave of baptism as His child, a member of His bride, the most valuable thing there is. The invitation, George. If you're subject to it, please, won't you come? While together we stand. Why are we sing? There's a strange.